So when we say Jews introduced monotheism to the world, I'm not even sure that's true. What we introduce to the world is that God is not an object, he's a someone. And what makes him a someone? He has preferences, he chooses, he, he, ha he has opinion and feeling. <clears throat> Let's start with what is God? Which is also strongly connected to what is belief? What does it mean you believe in God? It makes it really sound like there is no God, you just have to believe it. God is a figment of your belief. So if you believe very strongly, then God is very real. If you don't believe, then he's not real. Like people say, I wish I could believe, but I don't. So there are the believers, and there are the non-believers, and you can't switch from one to the other. And if a non-believer says, I started to believe, he lost his mind. <laughs> he must have had a terrible experience. Because what would do that to a person? So first, what is God? The definition of God, simple, literal definition, that which was at the beginning. The universe had a beginning. This is not, <laughs> not rocket science. The universe had a beginning. What was that beginning? We call it God. And from that beginning, from that original being, everything else evolved. Whether it was a big bang or a little bang, two bangs, whatever it was, but it all started with something. That something is God. As a result of this simple definition, there is no one who doesn't believe in God. except people who don't want to think. But the theory of evolution, for example, is a belief in God. But the God that they're talking about is a subatomic particle. There was a subatomic particle that was eternal, that was there at the beginning, it exploded, and the rest is history. So everyone has a God. Anyone who thinks. What came at the beginning? So there was this atheist, for I forget his name, he passed away recently, he wrote books. God is not great. What was his name? Christopher Hitchens. Hitchens? Hutchins? Hitchens. So he was being interviewed, and the interviewer pressed him. You don't believe in any God? No God at all? Not a Jewish God, not a Christian God, not a, no God at all. And he said, no, no, no. He said, then how did it start? And he got annoyed. And he said, I don't have to answer that. Okay. <laughs> you don't have to answer it. I just thought I'd ask. <laughs> I'm not forcing you to answer, but do you have an answer? He doesn't have to answer that because that's not part of science. That's silly. It's very much part of science. The whole thing, the whole theory of evolution is trying to figure out origins of the universe. What do you mean that's not part of science? So God is a scientific fact. And we're trying to identify it. Trying to pin it down. So if you want to refer to God as it, that's fine. That's legitimate. Now, what is the Jewish concept of God? What do we know about God because of revelation, because of uh, the conversations that Avraham had with God and Yitzchak had with God and Yaakov had with God? What do we know about God? Take a look at the laws of idolatry. What constitutes other gods that we're not allowed to worship. 
or believe in. If I would believe, as some scientists do, that there was this particle, it's not even a subatomic part, it's something, a particle, and that particle contained all the information and all the wisdom and knowledge that designs the universe, that controls the universe, and so on. And from that particle, everything else came to be. Is that idolatry? In simple words, are we supposed to attribute all great intelligence to God and to no one else? And if you attribute great intelligence to something other than God, you're worshipping idols? Like the, the, what is the, the counterpart to evolution, the theory of evolution, is intelligent design. As if evolution doesn't believe in intelligent design. Evolution means an intelligent evolving of a universe. Nobody denies that there's intelligence. And if you attribute that intelligence to a particle, that's maybe wrong, but it's not idolatry. If you attribute all intelligence to aliens, as some people do, the world was created and designed by aliens. Is that idolatry? No. Intelligence is not unique to God. Then what constitutes idolatry? What constitutes idolatry is volition. To believe that there is a particle that can decide whether it wants to create a world or not, that's idolatry. Because everything in creation is a fixed design. It doesn't have freedom of choice. Only God, the original substance, is totally free to do as he wants. So if you attribute that kind of independent will to anything in creation, that's idolatry. So the Jewish God is the original being who is free to choose to, desi to decide what he wants to do. And he decided to create the world. So why do we refer to God as a he? Not, not rather than she. Why he rather than it? Because if God chose to create the world, there's a personality there. It's not an it anymore. It's a someone. So that is the insight, the revelation, the, the contribution that Jewish thought brings to the belief in God. So when we say, Jews introduced monotheism to the world, I'm not even sure that's true. What we introduce to the world is that God is not an object, he's a someone. And what makes him a someone? He has preferences, he chooses, he, he, ha he has opinion and feeling. To put it in very simple, because we have to cut it short, God created the world. If you ask most people, what do you mean by God? They'll say, the creator. Why do we say that? Because that's how the Bible begins. In the beginning, God created. So what do we know about God? He created. Only Jews have the chutzpah to read that verse and say, why? Why did he create the world? What can he possibly gain by creating a world? If he was already God, good enough. What's he missing? And that, I'm predicting the future, that is going to be the question of the future. It's not, is there a God? Of course there's a God. The question is, what does he want? Because if he created the world, he created it out of choice. If he chooses to, 
it means he wants something. He's after something. There's a vast eternal plan. What's the plan? This is not a Kabbalistic question. It's not a religious question. You could call it scientific. The cause of the universe was a decision made by its cause. Well, what, what's that decision? So really what we argue about is not the existence of God. If you really put it simple, if you say, I believe God exists, you're talking nonsense. Because if he does, he does, whether you believe it or not. And if he doesn't, then he doesn't, whether you believe it or not. So to ask, do you believe that there is a moon? It's a, it's a silly question. The question is, what does he want? That's a relevant question, and it's a question we've always asked without realizing it. Everybody throughout all of history has always asked, what is the purpose of life? No? Most universal, the most historical, why are we here? Why are we here? What are you asking? What are you really asking? <coughs> We've been here for 5,000 years, settle down. <laughs> why are we here? Get used to it. And you don't even know of any other place. What is this question? The question is, if the world was created, it must have been with a purpose. What's the purpose? And why do we ask that? Because we're the result of that purpose. So if I don't know the purpose for my existence, I don't know myself. Somebody pointed out, isn't it amazing that every creature, every being, every substance in the world has its place? A cow is a cow. A bug is a bug. A tree is a tree. They do their thing devotedly, constantly, without question. Only the intelligent creature, the human being, can't figure out what he's doing here. Isn't that amazing? We don't know where we fit. To the point where many people believe that nature is perfect, the world, the universe would be perfect if human beings would just disappear. We're the clutter. We mess everything up. That's pretty sad. So the question of why are we here is really a question of who caused this? But I didn't. So you know this guy who is suing his, <coughs> he's suing his parents for giving birth to him without his consent? <laughs> What's bothering him? What's his problem? He resents being born? But by doing that, he opened a Pandora's box. Now he's got everybody thinking, yeah, I wasn't asked. Hey, I wasn't asked. This is not my decision. What am I doing here? Who did this to me? That used to be a religious question. Not anymore. So <clears throat> what does it mean to believe in God? from a Jewish perspective. To believe that he exists, that's nonsense. Either he does or he doesn't. It's not a subject for faith. Faith means that which cannot be explained rationally. Can't, not that we don't have an explanation. It cannot be known. And when we face an issue that cannot be known, we have another tool in our repertoire called faith, with which we can deal, we can handle stuff that the brain cannot. So if you're optimistic, where is that coming from? If you're optimistic, people will say to you, oh, come on, get real. Be realistic. 
Oh, so optimistic is not real? What, pessimistic is real? <laughs> they ask this pessimist, can't you think of anything positive to say at all? Nothing positive? He says, yes, yeah, yeah, there is something positive. <laughs> Today is much better than tomorrow is going to be. <laughs> That's positive thinking. What is, it? What is faith in God? Faith in God simply means familiarity. We know he exists, but from a distance, irrelevant to our own existence. Faith means making God familiar. So when somebody asks you, why do you believe in God? And you give him this whole thing about where did the world begin and who created the world? That's not what he's asking. What he's asking is, there is a God. Why do you care? Why, why are you going to base your life on God? Which is a good question. And it isn't always a rational decision. So your mind will insist that there is a God. Your mind does not insist that you have to serve him. Your mind will tell you that you are dependent on him. If he's God, he has the football. If he doesn't want to play, the game is over. So you're dependent on him. So you have to pray to him, you have to appease him, you have to fawn on him, compliment him, so that he'll be good to you. That's horrible. Unfortunately, Jewish exposure to that kind of thinking over the centuries, you know, we, we, we absorb what the environment what the environment gives us and it became part of Jewish thinking which is very sad here's what Jewish thinking should be we are not needy and dependent on God God is the one who is needy and he is dependent on us that's faith emunah means a familiarity, like in Hebrew, the word uman means a craftsman, an expert, somebody who's familiar with. We are familiar with God because God needs us more than we need him. And that's why commandments, ten commandments, that translation has, has ruined everything. As soon as you say God has commandments, He's no longer friendly. He's not the one who's needy. Now you got to watch your step because <coughs> you violated a commandment. That's not Jewish thinking. Jewish thinking is when God spoke to us at Mount Sinai, he wasn't telling us what we must do. He's telling us what he must have. The kind of world he needs and the kind of world he, um, he envisioned when he created it. So God revealed himself. That's why it's called revelation at Mount Sinai. <clears throat> if we could get this into our, into our thinking, into our educational system, we need God? If he created us, then who needs whom? How did we become the needy ones when he created us? So, well, don't we need to eat and sleep and drink? So, well, that's how he created us. So this guy who says, I'm suing my parents because they gave birth to me without my consent, he's right. Only you can't blame your parents because they have the same problem. They also were not asked <laughs> whether they want to be born. So eventually your complaint has to be to God himself. So you should come to God, and this is so Jewish. You come to God and say, God, you created me with a need to eat. So give me some food. 
Like this guy says, you gave birth to me, got to pay all my bills. <laughs> He's right. If he was demanding it from God. And that's why God says, if you follow my commandments, I'll give you, you'll have, you'll be. He's indebted. This is not reward. This is only fair. I created you because I need you this way. Well, if you need me this way, make it, make it work. Give me the bread that I need. Keep me healthy. Otherwise, how can I serve you? So two things happen when we switch. Who is the needy party here? Religion has used this as a whip. You better be religious because you're so dependent on him. If he's turned off to you, you're in big trouble. You're going to go to hell. It's, it's so not Jewish. And when you hear it from a rabbi, it, it really, it really, it, it's, it's horrific. We've been so infected by this thinking. It's not Jewish. So, this minister back in Minnesota, very nice guy we met, we were introduced for the first time, and he says, so do you believe in Jesus? And he, wasn't, he wasn't being uh, aggressive or, he was straight talking, wants to know what I believe. So I said, I, I don't know much about Christianity, but I'm not looking for a God who's going to help me. I'm looking for a God that I can do for, not have him do for me. And that's it. There was, he, there was nothing he could say. He started to cry. And he says, you know, I never thought of that. Are we here to get from God what we need, which he made us need? This doesn't make any sense at all. What is life all about? Fulfilling your needs. Did I ask for these needs? <laughs> no. But you've got to spend your whole life taking care of your needs. And if you don't, you go to hell? I mean, <laughs> this is mind-boggling. <laughs> no. God is the needy one, not us. This has two very important virtues. One is, God becomes lovable. Not distant and cold and invulnerable. And number two, what a relief. I'm not the needy one. That is such a burden off of our conscience. What's wrong with you? When are you going to be? How come you don't? Wait, you should. You, you better. No, no, no. I don't have to anything because I didn't create myself or the world. I'm here because he has a vast eternal need. And if I can do something for him, my existence is justified. Otherwise, I got no problems. So that's the future of psychology. We're going to stop looking for deep, repressed needs. Thank you very much. I don't need any more needs. Don't tell me I have more needs than I think I have. Tell me that I don't have any needs because I didn't ask to be born. Now, why am I here makes all the sense in the world. And the only answer to that is, well, ask whoever created you and hope that he had a purpose. <laughs> Otherwise, we're all in trouble. We're here for nothing. Partner with Rabbi Friedman. Visit itsgoodtoknow.org forward slash support.